They're so ubiquitous, they can be pretty much anywhere, pretty much. Exactly. And everywhere, which they have. But, let's get into some little backstory here. Mm -hmm. Now, did you know that in Virginia, a couple years during the sort of early 1800s, there was this weird plague that was happening there? No. It was weird. There was a plague, there was this woman who was affected, and for some reason, her skin and hair was perfect for some reason. No decay, no growth. It was like she was just freshly buried the entire time, even though she'd been buried a month ago. That's weird. Now, the reason she died was a cholera outbreak that was going on at the time. But the locals were convinced that somehow she was a actual legit vampire somehow, because there were some weird things going around in the canine areas of the teeth. Where it was sort of mute, it looked like she had fangs in a way. So the locals, thinking of a logical way to deal with this, thought of the only way to deal with it stab her in the chest with a crucifix, cut out her heart, and then, bear, and then burn the corpse. It, it was logical for the 1850s or whatever this was, pretty much. But did you know that there's actually three ways you can freshly kill a vampire? How's that? Well, there's the old. Stab it through the heart with a wooden stake. One of them is what you said: stabbing through the heart with a stake, cutting off the head, and keeping the head and the body separate in different places. I see. But the other one is cutting out the heart, stuffing the mouth with garlic, and tearing out the ears. On second thought, let's just stick with the staking, pretty much. However, this little story inspired someone else, actually, who was reading into it, actually. You see, this case became a bit popular worldwide because they thought, oh my god, an actual vampire in America and stuff like that. Mm. And the person that got really into that was an Irish author by the name of Bram Stoker, or Abraham Stoker is his full name. Exactly. Now, Bram Stoker was a Irish writer, but he was also kind of like an owner of a theater, pretty much. And being into theater, he met a lot of people that were into mysticism and stuff like that, pretty much. Yeah. And also, because, you know, he came from a very conservative Irish family, he believed in a lot of folklore himself, pretty much. Mm. Now, he also heard about another case that was going on. There was this weird case of a village somewhere in Eastern Europe, maybe in either Greece or possibly Romania, hard, hard to tell, where they had this weird tradition that they would always check the bodies before they were, you know, buried and stuff like that, to make sure they were dead. And Bram was so into that that he thought, 
What if they made a book that gave a personality to a vampire? You see, vampire novels before this were focused mostly on the human people. They didn't really give much of a personality to the vampire, really. Exactly. So Bram Stoker set about his work, and in 1897, Dracula was released to the worldwide public and became one of the most popular vampire novels of all freaking time, pretty much. Exactly. And I can see why. It's a really good book. I've read parts of it. I remember reading the story when I was younger. Interesting fact about the book, the book is kind of fragmented in a way. It's told from diary entries, letters, journals, doctor's notes, all that kind of stuff. Exactly. And um, our boy Dracula in it is, well in the novel he's a bit weird. He's prescribed as, yeah, at first when they first meet he's an elderly old man pretty much and all that. But then later when he gets some nourishment in his body he becomes more dapper looking and all that. And then, well, after that, it got really popular, that book. And it's a good thing it became popular around that time because a new little invention was just coming out. Motion pictures. Oh yeah, that's true. And the book got a lot of tension, particularly in Central European countries where mysticism was widely believed at the time. And particularly, the creators of Nosferatu became very interested in the book. Oh yes, I remember. I mean, when you think about it, Nosferatu is just basically a German retelling of the, of the Dragon of the Myth, pretty much. Pretty much. In fact, it was a little too close for comfort, which made Bram Stoker's widow nearly sue them, actually. Yeah, I remember that. They had to pay her a lot of money for that, yeah. I remember watching Nosferatu, actually. Yeah, ours was, was really good. Ours was good. We had David Carradine introduce us to the film, pretty much. And since it's a silent film, Instead of like that old time music, they actually put in like like heavy rock and metal. We're not here talking about Nosferatu. We're here talking about Dracula. Yeah, so that's uh, a review for another day. So let's talk about the movie now. Made directed by Todd Browning or Carl or something like that. I believe so. Yes. Who, ironically enough, would later direct a film called Freaks, actually. Yes. Which was another film we got to look at eventually. Exactly. If I could ever find a copy of it anywhere. So, most of you pretty much know how the story goes down. It's the story of Dracula. It's a story that's been told over and over and over and over and over and over and over and... I'm stopping. Alright. But, what makes this film, like, the film that it's... Let's talk about THE film, pretty much. Yes. If you know what I'm saying. Yes. So, interesting fact about this film, we actually get to see something that most of the novels don't actually show, pretty much. Renfield. That's true, yes. Like, we get Renfield in the novel, but he's barely mentioned pretty much at, at most of the times. So it's nice to see that he's got more of a thing. Did you hear at one point they were planning on making like a, a spin-off film with Renfield as the lead, pretty much? Hmm. Which would have been cool, I think, pretty much. Yeah, that would have been pretty cool. But, eh, maybe it's best we didn't get that. Yeah. So, we start out with Renfield, and he's entering a little Romanian town, pretty much. Yes. Now, I read the subtitles, for some reason they're speaking in German for some reason, but okay. I mean, there were some German speakers in Romania at the time, so yeah. Yeah, that's, that's true. Alright. And Renfield gets the whole treatment of going into town, he gets warned about the Castle Dracula, and is given the little holy symbol by that little lady, pretty much. Exactly. But it's weird, because in the novel, it's Jonathan that gets all this done, pretty much. Yeah. Then again, I think they had to cut Jonathan out because there was a controversial scene in the book that they couldn't film in 1930s. It's the bride scene. Right. Yeah, they wanted to show these very voluptuous women and all that seducing Jonathan Harker and everything. But since this was the height of the Hays Code, I'm pretty sure they wouldn't be able to get away with that. Oh, big time. So, instead they had to rely on Renfield and, Hey, look! It's Ren Renfield! And he's played by that dude who will later be in uh, Frankenstein. Yeah, and also on The Invisible Man. I love this actor. He's really good at playing weird, creepy characters, pretty much. Yeah. And I gotta admit, he does give Renfield a bit of a character to his own, pretty much. Usually in the novel, Renfield's just described as a broken, crazed man and all that. But in this one, it looks like he's become, like, full-on obsessed and stuff like that. Exactly. He wants to serve his master well, but there's a part of him that kind of feels like it doesn't anywhere. Exactly. So... He gets on a carriage, being driven by a very tall, dark-looking figure, pretty much. 
Exactly. And, and the carriage is bumping around a little bit. Oh, yes. So when he goes to put his head out to tell the driver to slow down, he sees nothing but a vampire bat. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Unfortunately, this is 1930, so it's pretty much just like a bat on a little screen. Yeah, much. you can totally see the screen. Look, I'm not going to say the effects have aged particularly well, but it is what it is. Mm -hmm. 1931, what can you do? So, he gets to Castle Dracula, and we finally get to meet the big guy himself. The big D himself, Dracula. King of Vampires. Played by the ever-popular Bela Lugosi in this. Oh, yeah. Now, I gotta say, Bela Lugosi pretty much nails this version of Dracula. Well, nails this version of Dracula, if you me. I mean, think about it. The mannerisms, the voice, the accent, the weird finger things and all that. It really captures. I feel bad, though, for Bela Lugosi, though, because after this role, he was pretty much regaled. Pretty much to just play versions of Dracula for the rest of his career, pretty much. Yeah, it's a sad thing, but he was a bit of an asshole in real life. Yeah, Bela Lugosi was a bit of a jerk in real life, and he was a heroin addict also. Yeah. In fact, if you want to see a, a very dramatic version of Bela Lugosi, I would recommend watching uh, Ed Wood, pretty much. Yeah. Because at least Martin Landau makes him a little more sympathetic, pretty much. That's true. And so, Dracula introduces Renfield into his home, buys up the Carfax Abbey thing so he can have a place to strike England from. And as you see in the paperwork, he accidentally gets a paper cut on his finger. But he sees the cross. Ah. The cross is repelled. So instead he makes him his slave eventually, right? Yeah. And now, it makes sense for Dracula to have a human slave to work with, probably. Well, obviously, you need somebody who can go out in the daytime. Exactly. So Dracula's taken out to England. And we get the famous thing where he kills everybody on the boat, pretty much. Yeah, I remember seeing, like, the captain's shadow. Oh, yeah. Like, tied to the mast. Damn. Well, they couldn't actually show the body because that would get them restricted. I know, but it's like, holy shit. Actually, strange enough, there's another weird thing that they kind of implied in the books, but they never actually show. When Dracula gets to London, he actually kind of spreads a plague around, actually. Oh yeah, that's true. Like in the novel, which they kind of barely reference, but in Nosferatu they really focus on, apparently Dracula spreads a plague around London that gets everyone sick, apparently. Mm -hmm. But, eh, that's not important. So he gets off, and you can clearly tell this is the 1930s because of all the colors, pretty much. Totally. Like, hey, at least he's got the dapper top hat and everything. And he gets to kill a flower girl. Yay! Yeah. Hey, uh, I would want a rockin' flower on my outfit. Pretty much. And he does it with his weird eye stare thing, pretty much. The hypnotizing eye movement. Pretty much. Then we're introduced to our uh, rather bland protagonist, Jonathan Harker, pretty much. God, I always hated, like, how the universe of Lost movies, the... The love interest... The love interest is always, like, so bland. Pretty much. Like, bland is, like, vanilla. Land is bread, pretty much. Pretty much. I mean, it's like if the poor lady walks into the room and she's like, Hey, what's up? I'm Jonathan Harker. I'm the uh, main character of the film. Oh, nice. Then we see Bella Ghost comes and goes, Leave me. Yeah, I'm gonna go that way. <laughs> <laughs> no offense. There are some good ones, but the majority of them suck, pretty much. Pretty much. Okay, so he introduces himself to Dracula, to Jonathan Harker, and I think Dr. Stewart's there also? Dr. Stewart's there, also Nina's there, and also Miss Lucy. Lucy, yeah. Yeah. And, well, no surprise, he's got the hots for Lucy, pretty much. And he shares that interesting line. What was that? Remember the... Oh, the toast. Yeah, right. the toast. I'd say, lofty as they were, as though the dead were here. Lofty timbers, the wolves around her bare, echoing into her laughter. You gotta love these Universal films. They got some very quotable quotes and poems in them, pretty much. I know, it's wonderful. Exactly. So, once that happens, Dracula gets set up in Carfax, and then something weird happens. Oh, yeah. We get to see a bat flying to Lucy's room, right? And again, yes, it's a very, very obvious bat on the street, pretty much. <laughs> And Dracula nips her on the neck again, and 
Well, she starts to get pretty sick. Or does she die right away? No, in this one she dies right away. No, that's weird because in the book she actually gets kind of sick at first, pretty much. Well, yeah, because she lost a lot of blood. And she had fever, basically. And they had to do something that was actually a very unique science at the time, blood transfusions. Well, unfortunately, though, blood transfusions don't work nowadays. No. If anything, they'll actually kill you quicker, pretty much. So, we cut that subplot, and then we cut to Edward Van Sloan as Abraham Van Helsing, pretty much. Oh, yeah. One of the best, in my opinion, pretty much. Ironically, though, this guy would also kind of reprise this role a little bit in The Mummy, also. Yep, he'll be in The Mummy. He also does that in uh, Frankenstein. Yeah, pretty much. Like, this dude plays a lot of weird elderly professor character, pretty much. But strangely not, but strangely enough, not in Creature from the Black Lagoon and The Invisible Man. But they couldn't get him for that, probably. Yeah. So, we see him as obviously one of the best Van Helsing performances I've seen. Oh, yes. Which is based on because I actually kind of like Van, uh, I kind of like the Anthony Hopkins version of Van Helsing pretty much. Still better than what we got with Hugh Jackman. Let's not go there. I don't blame Hugh for that one. I blame the shitty CGI. The shitty CGI and the acting. <laughs> and also the directing, the directing, producing, writing. Yeah, so I don't hate Hugh for that. Pretty much. So, Van Helsing's got this. Now it's weird. In the book, Van Helsing is not at all what we see in the movies, pretty much. In the movie, he's kind of just a happy go lucky, sort of stereotypical Dutchman, pretty much. In this one, not so much. And there was something, though, in the book that may have given way for this. Then Helsing has these serious moments, if you know what I mean, where someone will mention like, hmm, that's weird, she seems to be losing a lot of blood. And I'll just put on a straight face and go, really? <laughs> Pretty much. It's actually kind of fun, fun, actually. Yeah, it is. And, yeah, so they're looking over Lucy, and they realize that she was bitten to death, pretty much, right? She was drained of blood. That's what killed her. And guess who just so happens to come by to pay his respects? Our boy, Mr. D. This, these motherfuckers are, they don't know what the word subtle means, or, it, like, not discreet. Granted, I mean, how can you discreet with a cloak that big, pretty much? Exactly my point. I'm in front of the cloak. I like the cloak. I know you like the cloak. So, Dragon is all like, oh, I'm so sorry that she's made it and everything. Oh, hello, who are you? He's like, hey girl, how you doing? I've got a big cape and it's, uh, as you can see, pretty big. Mm -hmm. no. She's got back ears. <laughs> back dog. Actually, I wanted to take this opportunity to speak about something that they also cut from the book in this, actually. Yeah. Some of the side characters also. Yes, that's true. Like, um... For some reason, Dr. Stewart in this is Mina's dad, apparently, or something like that, right? Yeah. Which is weird, because in the book, they're not related. They're just good friends, that's all. Yeah, pretty much. In fact, if anything, Dr. Stewart's younger, actually. <laughs> yeah, in fact, he's actually a, an apprentice to Abraham Van Helsing, pretty much. Which, ironically, is what Bram Stoker's first name is, Abraham. Yes. Yes, that's true. But then there's some other characters they cut out. For example, there's uh, Lucy's uh, husband, uh, Arthur Homewood, who's basically just your stereotypical high-class British gentleman, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. And then there's Quincy Morris, who they cut out, who's supposed to be like the token American of the group, pretty much. Oh, yeah, and he also had the thing for Lucy. She had a lot of suitors, by the way. She got that money. I kind of like Quincy in this because he's sort of like, it's weird, like we got all these stuffy British gentlemen and then we're out of nowhere we got this cowboy-like character pretty much. Yeah. yeah, he's a Texan and in the book, unfortunately, it's painfully obvious that Abraham, uh, that Bram Stoker had never spoken to an actual American because his dialogue is kind of ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. Pretty much. Anyways. So, that's going on. We get Dracula schmaltzing his way in because somebody, wait, how did he get in the house? Well, you have to be... Don't you have to be invited by the owner of the house to come to get in? But I believe they did invite him. I guess, yeah. I'm pretty sure they did. Mm, pretty much. But then there's some other stuff they cut out from the book, like the fact that Dracula can only be strong on certain nights, and he can change into certain animals at a certain night, pretty much. 
I'm kind of glad they didn't add that in because that's kind of ridiculous, though. So. Well, apparently he can't cross running water off some. Again, that's ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, this film's good and all, but a lot of scenes in this is just people in the room talking, pretty much. Well, to be fair, this was the first Universal Monster movie. They were just still... They were just figuring out, pretty much, yeah. Anyways, so I think uh, Van Helsen, he... He's the only one that knows that basically Dracula is a vampire. Well, he only found out because he was going for a cigarette in the cigarette box. And that cigarette box just happened to have a little mirror on it. Exactly. And he looks in the mirror box and, oh, this guy ain't got no function. Didn't he confront Dracula about it, pretty much? Yeah, but first they send Mina to go to go away because of she woman can't be seeing this. Ah oh boy. Nineteen thirties America, what can you do? Actually nineteen thirties fruit technically, but yeah. Fuck's sake. Anyways. So Mina goes away. And Fred Helsing confronts Dracula about it. Exactly. He smashes the mirror out of his hand. Mm-hmm. And then I think he tries to well, he's about to eat, like, drain Van Helsing, right? But yeah. Van like, oh no, you don't. Yeah. Yeah, he can't kill mere religious symbols, especially the crucifix. Either that or Wolfsbane. Which is weird, because I thought only Wolfsbane affected war wolves. I see. Okay, okay. So, while that's going on, Renfield has been uh, admitted into the asylum, also, right? Yes, and he broke out. Those bars made of paper or something like that. <laughs> and he basically is warning them that you should send me away before it's too late. See, this is what makes um, Renfield actually most compelling in this. Because he's technically still under Dracula's control, but he's still trying to fight against it, basically. Well, he's probably seen enough death to last a lifetime. He doesn't want any more. Exactly. And of course, we also. Isn't that also where we get the famous. <laughs> Yes. Rats! Yeah, pretty much. Now, they were planning to film that, actually, but the problem was they couldn't get enough rats for that scene, actually. But, eh, they kind of did it in other drag of the films. <sighs> so, while that's going on, doesn't Mina get attacked or something like that? Or? Yeah, Mina gets summoned from her bedroom because Dracula is waiting outside. Man, he is straight up pimping, man. Oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> But don't, don't the servants see her or something like that? No, I think... I think Dracula makes the... Like the servants faint. Oh yeah, he does it with his fainting, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And so Mina goes outside and gets attacked. Yep. But she's not dead. No, no, he just gave her a little peck in the cheek, if you know what I mean. In the neck. In the neck, right, yeah. And then we get some weird, wacky side characters with, like, the stereotypical guard, like, Oh, what's your wish then, all that, you know? And oh, yeah, the, the uh, asylum guard that watches his Renfield. Really? You cut out Quincy Morris, but you gonna um, put this guy in, pretty much? And everyone goes to check on me, but the maid, she, she wakes up. Yeah. And is in the living room. Renfield scares the living room. <laughs> just get shit out of her. And she faints. And then he kind of crawls toward her. Okay, Renfield, back away, buddy. It's like, okay, back off. Go away. I know she's unconscious, but holy shit. No means no, Renfield. But thankfully, they catch him, right? Yeah, they, they caught him. And they put him back in his cell and everything. We're going to skip a little details here, because let's get to the ending now, actually, which is the most interesting part, pretty much, for me. Pretty much. Because eventually they do get Mina again, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing about this movie. There's a lot of talking scenes, but it's only near the end and the beginning that it gets really interesting. So in this one, he gets Mina. And, and, he, he, takes he, and he takes her to not Carfax Abbey, but an abandoned uh, building. I think it's an abandoned church, actually. Yeah, it's an abandoned church. Wait, wasn't Carfax an abandoned church? So why do you bother taking through this completely different place, man? Because that was that'd be the first place they suspect. Ah, I see. So they go out. I think it's Van Helsing, Stewart, and Harker that go to get them, or is Stewart staying at the house. No, much? Stewart's at the house. Okay, so it's Harker and Van Helsing going to save the day, pretty much. Yeah, and Dracula he kills Renfield because Renfield failed him basically. 
think he snapped his neck. I think so. It's implied that he either snapped his neck or twisted his neck, actually. And then his lifeless body... Is thrown down the stairs, pretty much. Pretty much. You gotta feel bad for Renfield. He had a chance of redemption, but Dragon would just snap his neck like that, pretty much. Pretty much. So, our heroes go to find Dracula, but they don't know where his coffin is. Because in the basement it's a maze. And it's very dark, I imagine. Oh yeah. But eventually they do find Dracula's um, casket and everything. Yes, and they stake... They, well, Van Helsing, I think, stakes him, I think? Yes. Off screen, because we can't see that, apparently. And, and Jonathan we'll... finds Mina. And then Mina and Parker go back home. To be true, I think she honestly just went with Dragon because she's like, oh, my husband, my fiance's so boring. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and no, Dragon is dead. We cut to credits. Whew. I gotta admit, this Dracula film is okay and everything, but there's just a lot of boring scenes in it, don't you think? Yeah, I admit there are some parts that I'm like, okay, wrap it up. You don't need to see this part. It's 1931, so they were doing the best they could, pretty much. But honestly, after seeing the cavalcade of Dracula stuff we've gone over the years, this is, like, not as impressive, really. Well, back in the day, this was, like... The top shit, pretty much. The top stuff. Yeah. And it did frighten people in the theaters at the time. Because this was, like, bleeding technology. Pretty much. And you could admit that without this film, we probably wouldn't even get all those films made with Frank Vampires nowadays. So, yes, it may be a little slow paced and boring and only take some things from a novel. Yeah, they leave out a lot of stuff, but yeah. But you gotta remember, without this, we wouldn't even, like, have and vampire movies or Dracula. Yeah, totally. So, just give it a bit more respect. I will, I will. Oh, here's something interesting I found out, actually. What? Did you know that Dracula may have been based off a friend of Bram Stoker's, actually? I think you told me that, yeah. Well, see, Bram Stoker worked in the theater, right? Yeah. And he had a lot of theater friends. And there was one guy in particular who was basically the epitome of Dracula. He was tall, he was handsome, he was pale. He basically was Dracula to a T, pretty much. And there's a lot of speculation that if he had lived long enough, there were possibly rumors that he would have played Dracula, maybe, even. That he, he did him in play versions, but there were plans to maybe get him in the film, even. Oh, that the problem is he did for like almost 30 years by that point, so yeah. So, how would you rate this? Okay. I gotta admit, like, I've always been a bit of a sucker for vampires. They're so fascinating, right, pretty much? Totally. So, even though this is like pretty low in my list of vampire films that I would recommend, I would still watch it pretty much, just for how memorizing the performances of Bela Lugosi and the guy who does Renfield and the guy who does Abraham Van Helsing, those guys like elevate this film above the tedium of the, the other actors pretty much. Yeah, and it's nice to see like how it all began. Pretty much. It's like a neat little origin story like yeah, it's not so good when I first starts, but give it some time. I'm just saying. Well, if you've noticed most origin stories, they they don't... Mm -hmm. Like, you think that, yeah, they have their problems, but they have a huge impact. So, I have to give this film a 6 out of 10 for me, pretty much. And you? I'm gonna be fair and give this a 7 out of 10. Okay. I don't like how they treat women in these movies. I've never really enjoyed that. Mm -hmm aspect about it, but I I wouldn't watch anything else. Right. It is pretty good. So that's your rating? Yeah. Okay, thanks for thanks again for watching this um, video, folks. Don't forget to hit the like button and the subscribe button and the bell for notifications and all that. And also drop a comment below to see what you want us to do next. Hey, if you guys want, you can even drop a comment for another Universal Monster film we should review, pretty much. Exactly. And don't forget to also to look up our other films and stuff on World Order Studios and Silversmith Productions. And don't forget to share with your friends, pretty much. And also you can check us out on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Pretty much. So thanks again for watching our little Universal Dracula film. I swear we'll do some more Universal films as soon as we can. And on that, have a nice, nice day. day. Ew. What? Reek, you need a bath.
What's He's gonna bite you, but no way. What? What's wrong with me? Ugh. Oh. Okay. 